Howdy everyone, and today I'm taking a look at a Canon L lens that's beyond the credit limit of a lot of photographers, including myself, but one that could still be very interesting to hire. The Canon EF 11-24mm f4 USM L. It's a full frame lens for digital SLR cameras, that's right, a full frame lens that zooms as wide as 11mm. If you own a Canon camera, that is currently as extreme a wide angle as you can get. The zoom range of the lens starts at 24mm, already a very wide field of view, and stretches out cavernously to that widest point, an incredible zoom range. As you might imagine, it's actually quite tricky to get good pictures at 11mm because you're covering such an enormous field of view, there's just so much background to take into consideration. But it could be an incredibly useful lens for shooting indoors and dramatic perspectives outside. And 11mm is still an ultra wide angle even if you're using a crop censored APS-C camera, so it's definitely a versatile piece of kit. Because of that extreme wide angle, it's even usable as an astrophotography lens because you can take quite long exposures before seeing any star trails. It costs two and a half thousand pounds, or about three thousand US dollars. That's why I say it's probably a lens that will get hired a lot by photographers rather than bought outright. Are there alternatives? For a while now, Sigma have made far less expensive equivalent lenses, which can go as wide as 12mm, and they have also just released a new 12-24mm lens, which also has a constant maximum aperture of f4. Is there much of a difference between 12 and 11mm? Let's see. Here's some video at 12mm, and now 11mm. Again, 12mm and 11mm. There's certainly some difference, it's up to you whether that's a useful difference to you. I should also note that new manufacturer Irix are planning to launch their own manual focus 11mm lens, we'll keep an eye out for that one. Anyway, time to look at this Canon lens in question. This piece of kit is BIG big, and it weighs a ton, well not really, that would be stupid, it's well over a kilogram though. That huge glass front element is beautiful and frighteningly exposed there, the use of filters is obviously out of the question. But it is possible to use gel filters at the back of the lens, where we can see a heavy duty metal lens mount and a weather sealing gasket. The zoom ring isn't quite the smoothest to turn in the world, but then again it has to move some pretty huge glass elements, and it does at least turn quite evenly and precisely. The manual focus ring turns very smoothly and precisely, and as usual with Canon's modern USM lenses, you can turn it to make adjustments at any time. The USM autofocus motor is quiet, lightning fast, and very accurate. This lens does not have image stabilization. The lens comes with a large pouch and a lens hood that clips on positively to the front. It's nicely shaped, but only made of plastic and not metal, a surprise on such an expensive piece of kit. Overall though, the build quality is second to none, just keep that beautiful front element away from knocks and scratches, goodness knows how much it would cost to replace. Alright then, the all important image quality. Here it is on my 20 megapixel full frame camera, a Canon 6D. For this first image, I've turned off in-camera corrections just for now. At 11mm and f4, the lens is razor sharp in the middle with neutral colours and very good contrast. Over in the edges, the good news is that we also see excellent sharpness, a great achievement at this extreme wide angle. Unfortunately, we do see some quite clear chromatic aberration but you can use chromatic aberration correction in your camera or in editing to correct that nicely as you can see. Stop down to f5.6, to f8, or to f11, and you'll see very tiny improvements. Let's zoom in now halfway to 16mm, a more commonly used ultra wide angle. At f4, the lens remains bitingly sharp in the middle, and the corners are a little softer, but still fine. 
Those corners are about the same at f5.6 and a touch sharper at f8 and f11. Finally, let's zoom into 24mm. At f4, the lens is very sharp in the middle again, although not quite perfect. Again, the corners are a little softer. Once again, we see very gradual improvements as you stop down to f5.6, then f8, and finally f11. So, on a full frame camera, the lens performs really excellently at 11mm, but when you're zooming in, the corners of your images will respond well when you stop down the aperture. Ok, for anyone interested, let's see how this lens works on an APS-C camera, my 24 megapixel Canon EOS M3. At 11mm, straight from f4, the lens is very sharp in the middle and still pretty great in the corners. In my tests, it remained pretty much exactly as sharp when stopped down. How about 16mm? At f4, the lens is still very sharp in the middle, if not quite perfect, but the corners are surprisingly soft. There are small improvements as you stop down to about f8, but those corners still don't look great. And finally, 24mm. At f4, the lens is just a touch soft in the middle, and the corners, again, pretty soft. At f5.6 and f8, there are small improvements to the point where the image quality is useful in the corners and sharp back in the middle. Well, I don't think many photographers will be using this lens with an APS-C camera anyway, as it really is intended for full frame sensors. It's a considerably better performer on full frame than APS-C. Alright, let's see about vignetting and distortion on a full frame camera. Here's the image at 11mm and f4. We can see plenty of vignetting at this setting, so stop down to f5.6 or f8 for even brightness. And at 11mm we see a lot of barrel distortion here, although that is partly to do with how close I had to be to the test chart. Here, I've taken a few steps back, and you can see by the lines at the bottom of the image that distortion at normal distances isn't quite so bad. Anyway, once you zoom in to about 18mm, that distortion straightens out, and it stays very mild from that point until 24mm. Vignetting isn't too bad when you're zoomed in, either. The lens can focus as closely as about 26cm. I don't think many people will be trying to use this thing for macro photography, but anyway, the good news is that it's still nice and sharp at close distances. Let's see how this extremely wide lens reacts when the sun makes its way into your picture. Unsurprisingly, we do see some issues here. There isn't too much of a loss of contrast, which is good, but we do see plenty of flaring artefacts, particularly when you've zoomed in to 24mm. Sometimes I get time to test lenses for coma levels, so let's see how it works with a star field. Over in the edges, bright points of light at 11mm and f4 are stretched, perhaps unsurprisingly, but we're not seeing much in the way of perpendicular coma, so it's actually a good performance here. Finally, bokeh. I can't imagine anyone in their right mind buying this lens for its background separation capabilities, but it is possible to get some dramatic close-up images, and in that case, your outer focus backgrounds will always look very nice and soft. Overall, well, considering the extreme parameters of this zoom lens from Canon, the optics are pretty commendable. It's sharpest at 11mm, where you would want it to be. Distortion at normal distances isn't too bad, and neither is coma. The biggest optical issue with this lens is probably flaring, and there are more obvious questions of its size, weight, and cost. Unless you're a professional architectural photographer, the thought of buying this lens outright shouldn't really be on your radar, and most hobby photographers might find themselves happy with Sigma's similar lenses. Another option is the excellent Lauer 12mm f2.8 from Venus Optics, or the new Irix 11mm lens when it finally comes out. But as a lens for hire, the Canon 11-24mm f4 USM L at least gives great enjoyment value, and it's undoubtedly an impressive professional option.